Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to uh, welcome you all here to the Bain Center for today's presentation from our esteemed alumnus, Dr. Paul Cadario. We're very proud to see the development of students into lifelong learners and global engineering leaders. And uh, Paul's career is an exemplary, exemplary example of how that can take place. He joined the World Bank in 1975 and spent nearly two decades uh, with the organization's frontline development program in West Africa and China, and then went to the public sector management throughout uh, Asia. In 1998, he began working on the World Bank's efforts to modernize and streamline its business for the digital age of transparency and accountability, starting with a renewal of the bank's global information systems. From 2001, he oversaw the multi-billion dollar portfolio grants managed and managed, I'm sorry, portfolio of grants managed and dispersed by the World Bank as trustees, as a trustee for governments, foundations, non-governmental non organizations, and private development partners. Over the course of his career, his work took him from Afghanistan to Zimbabwe, from Guinea to Indi Indonesia, from, from Bhutan to Burundi. But without regard to how busy Paul was with his commitments to the World Bank, he always made time for his alma mater. His, his ties as a dedicated volunteer to U of T have been strong for over 40 years. He was a member of governing council twice. He was the first president of the University of Toronto Alumni Association to live outside of the GTA. He chairs the Dean's Advisory Board for the faculty and the Board of Direct Advisors for the uh, Department of Civil Engineering. He is a member of the advisory boards for the School of Public Policy and Governance and for the Monk School of Go Global Affairs. He so also supports fundraising on behalf of the university as president of the Associates of University of Toronto, Inc and is a member of the University of Toronto Boundless Campaign Council. After he retired from the World Bank in 2012, Paul was appointed Distinguished Sen Senior Fellow in Global Innovation at the Faculty of Applied Science and with the Monk School of Global Affairs. In addition to working with faculty and students in the Master of, a, of Global Affairs program, and with PhD candidates in the Center of Global Engineering. Paul co-teaches a fourth year civil engineering capstone design course entitled Sustainable Global Communities. He earned his Bachelor of Applied Science in Civil Engineering from U of T in 1973. As a Rhodes Scholar, he also received a BA and MA in Philosophy, Politics and Economics from University of Oxford. More recently, he earned a master's degree in organization development from American U University, and in 2013, U of T award, awarded him an honorary laws degree. When he's not posting an update on Facebook or <laughs> tweeting from the airport, <laughs> Paul lives in Washington, D.C. with his partner, Dan Gordon. But today, we're ex very excited to have him back at U of T Engineering. Without further delay, Please, please join me in welcoming Paul Cadario. Well, good afternoon. Uh, it is a pleasure to give a talk here at Engineering. I um, want to start with a couple of shout outs. Uh, first, to my current and former students in Civ 498 uh, who are here in a large delegation this afternoon doing great things after they graduated and the projects this year are wonderful. CIV 498 is what civil engineers do for poor people in developing countries. And the teams come up with real poor people in real places that have real problems and come up with some innovative designs, whether it's slum upgrading or fixing the garbage collection in Cairo or providing water to uh, slum dwellers in Rangoon. That's, uh, they've done some great work this year. I also want to, uh, Say hello to uh, Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers is a Civ grad of 1939 and uh, 
is here today, and I understand he was a friend of my, worked and was a friend of my father, my late father, who worked in Ontario Hydro. So it's, uh, you know, engineering runs in the family. So Mr. Rogers, thank you. And just to uh, make sure that the, you know, the, the innovation that goes on in the private sector is here, Elizabeth McDonald is a great good friend of mine and the president of the Canadian Energy Efficiency Alliance Association. Alliance. Alliance um, who is busy looking for ways for that number one future fuel saving energy can be applied here in Canada. And of course my partner Dan Gordon who is used to saying around the house, this looks like a job for an engineer. So, uh, and as an expert in procurement, if any of you uh, want to hear about that, uh, because procurement is how things get done. Uh, this afternoon, um, this is a, a slide from 1870, 1828, um, it's called the March of Intellect. And 18, the 19th century was a time when engineering started to innovate and do things that changed first rich people's lives. This was before the internal combustion engine, but this artist uh, thought of some of the things that might exist. We see flying fish, we see various things to help the, uh, the rich live better. Uh, fairly clean streets for the early 19th century. But um, what this shows is uh, now, then as well as now, new inventions and new products lead to social change. And this is how often new things are depicted by people who don't really understand them. Later in the century, there were the Luddites. So what I want to start with this afternoon uh, is to remind ourselves that to make sense of the future, it's really important sometimes to think about the past and reflect for a moment on the on engineering in the 20th century and all the advances that uh, we enjoy because of what happened in the 20th century. Uh, where we are today, and think for a moment uh, about moving out into development from the time, uh, moving from right the cusp of the millennial development goals, which I will discuss, to the sustainable development goals, which will be discussed at the United Nations later this year that are relevant to the future of global development. And then to look a bit about how engineering development takes place in the 21st century. But first, a little question for the audience. And what I'd like you to do is turn to someone near you and say what to the, your neighbor. Uh, well, how did engineering improve lives and human well-being in the 20th century? Which I think everybody knows about, 20th century. So think for a moment and then perhaps turn to your neighbor and say, well, what innovation, what engineering thing improved people's lives in the 20th century? All right. Okay, can I, uh, can I just ask you, you've, you've had a good conversation, can I just have a few shout outs from the room about things people mentioned? Shout out. Mass electric power distribution. Thank you, mass electric power distribution. Sanitation, clean water. Sanitation, clean water, excellent, Philip. Others? Communications. Hmm? Communications. Communications, good. Yeah, absolutely. Medical equipment. Yep. Anything specific about medical equipment? All of it. All of it. <laughs> MRIs. MRIs. MRIs, yes. Good. That's a good list. Anything else? All right. The internet. The internet. Now, there's a few little uh, pictures of what happened, some of the things that changed our lives in the 20th century. Uh, water supply and sanitation, it's important to remember that at the beginning of the 20th century, there were diseases like typhus and typhoid and cholera that people in cities got. And they got that because water was dirty and there was no way to take away 
the effluent. But today, living in a modern city in a rich country, we don't worry about water. We don't worry that our sewage isn't going to, is going to be in the streets to give us diseases. It's important, though, to remember that water and sewerage is not universal in the world. Today, there are two and a half billion people who do not have adequate sanitation, and there are nearly 800 million people who don't have access to potable water. And there are six to eight million people who die every year of waterborne diseases, including malaria. Uh, electrification, excellent point. Uh, the 20th century was a time when many countries harnessed great hydroelectric power, when nuclear power was invented, and toward the end of the 20th century, solar and wind power became technically feasible and in some circumstances commercially productive to the point where in many countries a, a small but growing proportion of, uh, energy, of electric energy is produced by alternative sources. Uh, nonetheless, the uh, issue of energy still remains a pressing one given that we're all very worried about climate change, to which I will return. At the same time, there are still 1.3 billion people in the world who lack the reliable electricity or, frankly, electricity at all. Many of these people are in Africa, and there are about 500 million in South Asia, mainly in India. The lack of electricity means that you probably have a polluting wood stove. You have to go and gather uh, wood to uh, cook your food. You have air pollution inside your house. Your daughter cannot do her homework at night uh, because there is no light. Uh, and there are many would argue that the UN standard of a light bulb and a fan and a place to plug in your radio is not really a standard to which uh, we should say that's good enough if we can get those 800 million people with that standard. Medical devices and vaccines, and I would add vaccines. Uh, even when I grew up, polio was a very big issue. Uh, during lifetime of many in the room, smallpox was eradicated. And that was as much a logistical matter and a statistical matter as it was one of vaccine science. Uh, the medical profession, polled a few years ago by the American National Academy of Engineering, asked, well, what were the great tools that were invented? The number one tool was magnetic resonance imaging because it avoided unnecessary surgeries and allowed diagnosis without diagnosis in a fairly low radiation environment to, um, to save people's lives, again, in rich countries. Global supply chains are actually quite an important element of the 20th century, and they combine a number of these issues. They combine, combine the uh, widespread use and standardization of, com of containers as a way of transporting goods around the world. They involve uh, airplanes for the things that are small and light and pretty high value. But more as importantly, they involve uh, the internet, because it's possible for a consumer to buy something that's barcoded and that goes into a computer system of a supplier which is then sent by the internet to the factory in China that says, my, we are running out of blue. So we need to ship more, make more blue and ship more blue. So the whole concept of global supply chains, which has transformed how consumers consume, was made possible by engineering the containers. I think containers are probably the big invention. But all the container terminals, that's the port of Shanghai, actually, in that slide. Lasers and fiber optics are examples of the kinds of materials that, and high-performance materials uh, that get smaller and smaller. Um, I think I have on my person more um, computing power than went to the moon. That, again, part of engineering in the 20th century. Space exploration uh, has led to a lot of uh, things that are, we use in everyday life, including computers, of course. But how many people remember, how many people know Corningware, Pyrosoram? You know, all of us of a certain age remember our mothers had that with the blue flower on the side. Uh, does anybody remember Tang? Oh, yeah, a lot of the, again, that's a very age-specific thing. We wouldn't be caught dead with it now. But nonetheless, <laughs> to explore space was a time of great engineering innovation. Uh, it was a time of great commercialization. It said something about how space exploration got funded. Uh, but nonetheless, there were advantages to society other than understanding our universe better and understanding what could be done in low or zero gravity environments and producing a lot of very good motion pictures. 
Robotics, of course, meant that everyone who learned more robotics could become an automobile manufacturer. The Chinese, for example, thought, well, we can make automobiles. Uh, we have lots of workers. We can put the automobiles together. And the World Bank took a group of uh, automobile manufacturers uh, on a study tour around the world to look at BMWs, to look at General Motors, to look at uh, Korea, and say, you can't build cars if you can't build robots. So the Chinese said, right, robots. So they learned to build robots, and now they build cars. They're also buying technologies to, of people that make even better robots. But basically, one of the big inventions, one of the big contributions of engineering in the 20th century was the pieces of globalization, which is basically the uh, sharing, the transmission of products, of ideas, of views of the world that has changed our lives and everything we do because we live in a world that has become globalized. And probably, in my view, the big innovation, the big change in the 21st century, the 20th century, were cities. Because engineering made it possible to have clean water, get rid of the sewage, collect the garbage. It also allowed cities to grow tall, because elevators, the first elevators were commercially available in the early 20th century, and allowed cities to sprawl, because there was transport available, railways, cars, expressways. So the urban form that we see in the world today that creates cities is a source of great innovation, because people come to cities to prosper, the knowledge industries uh, develop, and a lot of the great innovation of the world has happened in cities. The financial centers are in cities, and half the world's population lives in urban areas, often by the sea. Nonetheless, that, I think, as engineers, we'll take credit for the 20th century, because I think that's really, if you think about it, what we do, because engineers make the quality of life possible in the world today. It is a world where not everyone has the same quality of life, but nonetheless, in the developed countries, and in cities, in many even poor countries, engineering has made that possible. So that's global, that's the jumping point to global development. Now, global development is very complicated. And I'll just let you look at this slide. There are some even more complicated slides to come. Now, this is a, a, a slide from a report of the United Nations Committee of Experts on how to pay for sustainable development. And so various interests are here, and if you look at it, it's actually a very interesting slide because it does two things. First, it, doesn't, it, it mainly talks about money, which is very important, but it doesn't talk about ideas. And because if you look at the sources, well, all public and private sources, source of ideas, source of political will to get things done, international public sources like the World Bank, the United Nations, international private sources, the great corporations that operate globally. But they're not only where stuff gets made and money gets spent, it's also where ideas and innovation happen. The center part is intermediaries, again, often to do with funding, but many of them, if you look at it, are about cooperation, about collaboration, about the role of government in making things happen. And the various instruments, again, those are all money, but a lot of them are engineered guarantees, equities, derivatives, uh, other perhaps more <coughs> difficult financial instruments, all engineered, and then the goals and uses. Now, it's funny that mm, goals and uses don't involve engineering. In fact, I was at a conference in India where a lawyer from Cambridge said, you know, the climate talks would go much better if the diplomats brought their engineers along and not just their lawyers. Because the engineers would say, well, yeah, you can do that, and this is the estimate of how much it will cost, and we'd have to solve this problem, this problem, this problem first. And maybe you should think whether you want to put that into the treaty as a, uh, a time-bound legal commitment, because it's probably going to be 50 years before engineering will get to that point. But in the meantime, you might like to do this and this and this and this, which are time-bound constraints. And there are a few governments that have actually looked at things that way, most notably the Netherlands, who's designed their protection against sea level rise because they don't know how much sea level is going to rise. So you don't want to say, worst case scenario, let's build for that. The Netherlands would be a very poor place if they had to put all their money into that. But if this happens, then this happens. So the government of the Netherlands has a very complicated set of scenarios 
and all of their building, all of their engineering projects are, okay, first let's build this because if the worst case happens, we'll need this and this and this, but we're not gonna build for the worst case. So there's a great uh, in engineering underpinning to global development, whatever you're planning for, and we'll come back to that. Now, the organizing principles for global development are today the Millennium Development Goals and the Sustainable Development Goals. The Millennium Development Goals were agreed by the leaders of the world in, at the United Nations in the year 2000. Uh, there are eight of them. The eighth one got added because it, wanted, it was a matter about money. But there are seven goals that have to do basically with supporting the main one, uh, eradicating extreme poverty and hunger. Actually, that was quantified to cut it in half by the year 2015. That goal has been met largely through the efforts of China and India, but that goal has been met. Now that's sort of an easy case scenario, but there are still probably 1.4 billion people in the world who survive on less than $1.25 a day. Um, a life that few of us could imagine, that some of us have seen, and that really should shock us all in this beautiful building, in this beautiful city. Uh, the others are uh, fairly straightforward. Um, quantifiable and have all been the subject of international efforts, uh, child mortality, uh, maternal health, a particular interest of uh, uh, Prime Minister and Mrs. Harper, uh, combating HIV, AIDS, and malaria, something that the global community took up and which benefits from the support of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the government of the United States. Ensure environmental sustainability, more could be done. Hope that is in me. Uh, in September, the leaders of the world will meet at the United Nations to look at the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, they're a little, uh, they're a much smaller print because to get all 17 of them on a slide takes a little effort. And uh, there are a number of people who say, well, these are a little complicated. I'll explain why in a moment. Now, that's not to say that they don't rely on the Millennial Development Goals. Um, the eradicating extreme poverty is still number one. Uh, achieving universal primary education. Uh, the goal under the Millennium Development Goals was universal, but it didn't matter really whether the children were learning anything, something that people worked out about six, seven years in. Oh, enrollments have gone up. Well, what are they learning? And people went around and looked and said, hmm, not learning very much. Like, they're there, but the teachers aren't very good. Small matter. Achieving gender equality and empowering women and girls. That's again, number three goal in the Millennium and in the MDGs. Um, that has been shown to be the most important way that countries emerge from poverty, if girls are educated. Because that gives them jobs, it gives them some power over their reproductive rights, it gives them a wish that their life be better for their daughters. That's the number one thing that can make a country prosper. And if girls are not educated, if women do not have rights, countries do not prosper. Now, the uh, in ensuring environmental sustainability gets a special place as goal number 16, which I will read. Promote peaceful and inclusive societies by sustainable uh, government provi uh, development, provide access to justice for all, and build effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions at all levels. Well, that's sort of environmental sustainability. That's sort of where it got in. But I want to point out a real, really important one. Number eight, promote sustained, inclusive, and sustainable economic growth, full and productive employment, and decent work for all. Now, that's rather important uh, because people who have jobs uh, innovate. People who have jobs have salaries. People who have jobs consume. People who have jobs don't have time to get into trouble. People who have jobs see a better life and want their children to be educated so that they will have an even better job. But it is interesting that jobs, which many people would consider something that's very inclusive and could involve everyone, that jobs is only goal number eight. And there's a whole school of thought about why that is and whether that needs to have <coughs> something done about it. And jobs are basically supported by goals 11 through 15 that uh, relate to the development of cities, 
that relate to having sustainable consumption and production patterns that relate to working on climate change, goal number 13. Now, why climate change is goal number 13 is, why it isn't further on the list, hard to say, but nonetheless, I think a good answer is that there is such a huge unfinished agenda on the MDGs, you can't sort of put them down at the bottom, even if some other things maybe are more urgent, or maybe need work, or maybe are going to be harder to do. Nonetheless, the elements of promoting a sustained global economy, a sustainable global economy, an inclusive economy with good jobs, that's the way you do it. And part of that has to do with protecting the resources of the world. And of course, this is also about money and institutions. Is there the political will to spend the money on the things that need to be done? And again, that was rather important. So let me just use one. I forgot to use my prop. That's a shame. I'll have to come back to that. Um, how the sustainable development goals relate to engineering. And I'm going to use climate change as the example, not just because I think that is the key challenge of humanity in the world today, uh, but also because I think that's something that engineers uh, looking forward can do something about or help do something about, and where some would argue that engineers have had a lot, have a lot to answer for for the sorts of things that were done in the past. And I'm going to use these pictures, and I have four. The first one at the upper left is a woman survey in the Philippines surveying the wreckage of her home after the super typhoon about a year and a half ago. Uh, there's been work now that shows, that has looked at who is going to suffer most from climate change, and it's women. Why is that? Well, it's everything from women may not have a cell phone so that they can get the text message that says you need to go to higher ground to the fact that women look after the home and children who are vulnerable in one of these emergencies, to the fact that women in many poor countries produce most of the food in their small gardens, to the fact that they, in many countries, many societies, do not share in the income and wealth of the family in a way that they can look after themselves. So climate change is something where building resilient communities involving women, uh, paying particular attention to the needs of women, or has multiple goals and multiple good impacts. I see my, some of my students uh, nodding wisely. Uh, we own the, the picture beside it is an African village, and there is a solar panel there. And the solar panel is an example of distributed electricity, which would provide a place for the people to plug in their smartphones where they can find out how much the uh, uh, products that they need are selling for in the nearby community, can receive text messages to remind themselves about taking their uh, antiretrovirals to stave off HIV, uh, can uh, be alerted to prenatal care opportunities that women who have registered need to be thinking about or come in for your checkup, uh, can power the light bulb and the fan. Maybe not that little one there. But nonetheless, um, the, the availability of decentralized electricity will make a huge difference in the villages of poor countries that may, for a number of years, let's hope not decades, never be connected to a grid. And at scale, some of those inventions will allow not only decentralization, but smarter grids that might power something more substantial, like a factory where women and men could go to work in the nearby village. Cities, lower left. Um, cities are rather important. As I said, half the world lives there. Uh, engineers have made it possible for cities to go tall and to sprawl. Uh, there are also examples of sustainable cities, so cities that have put in urban mass transit, uh, cities that have figured out ways for the rich and the poor to live together, and that I think is Jakarta, if I remember correctly, where the rich and the poor really do live together. Um, the rich in Jakarta, interestingly enough, are pumping the groundwater out uh, for their swimming pools, not for their water supply, but for their swimming pools. So the center of Jakarta is subsiding, which means that when they have rainstorms, 
in, well, several months of the year, all of the poor neighborhoods, which are beside the undredged canals in Jakarta, which are now lower, uh, get flooded out. Again, environmental, the rich and the poor living together, uh, but the rich and the poor having an impact on each other's lives. Again, cities are where the future is, but cities also have to adapt to the fact that, you know, if you're a rich person driving an SUV, you probably should pay the same for motor fuel whether you live in Rio de Janeiro or whether you live in Toronto. And just because you live in a poor country doesn't mean that you should get a deal on motor fuel for your SUV. I've put, uh, that looks like wheat, because one of the areas of great importance to the world if people are going to live in cities, and if water is going to be unpredictable, and if climate is going to change so pests may move around, or birds may decide to go further north, or bees may die, it's food systems. How do you provide the food from farmers, many of them smallholder farmers, some of them big industrial farmers? How do you get it to the markets? How do you d reduce food waste? And ultimately, what do you do about a world where as people get richer, they want to eat more meat. They don't want to eat rice, they want to eat grains, and they want to eat meat. And they want to eat fish, which are disappearing from the world. So again, the organization of food systems for the world is likely to become increasingly challenging as something to which engineers need to pay some attention. So, <clears throat> looking at what engineers could do, because I've tried to deal with the uh, uh, areas of perhaps the known unknowns. Two that I think are worth considering this afternoon are geoengineering and the impact of climate change on, migra on human migration. Geoengineering is something that is going to become very controversial. Uh, there are some who feel that uh, sending up some large planes to put some carbon fibers into the atmosphere would change the color of the earth, if you will, to reflect heat. And that would make global warming, well, it would abate global warming a bit while other solutions are found about decarbonizing the global economy. Uh, clearly that's a big experiment to do on the whole world. And uh, it's something that uh, people are still writing papers about. And people will still write papers about. But if you didn't like global brands, you're certainly not going to like geoengineering. Human migration is also an issue because as water becomes scarce, as land becomes less suitable for agriculture, as cities become more prosperous and therefore more attractive, people will want to move. People actually always have moved because of climate change. They move because of floods. They move because uh, areas have gotten warmer. But human migration is, as we all know, a political issue. Because it's not clear that every country wants to accept economic or political migrants. And certainly in the numbers that might have to move as a result of climate change, and nobody knows exactly what those numbers are, uh, it could add to already increased tensions about the movement of people. There has recently been a study, a paper that was released, that says that the problems that we're having, we're seeing in Syria and Iraq are basically about climate change. Because after five years of drought, the farmers moved from where they were farming and could no longer make a living. They, in Syria, they moved to the cities. And that left an ungoverned space. It left poor people who were desperate. And it created the conditions in cities where radicalization could take place. Now, that's correlation is not causality. But nonetheless, there are many who would argue that the problems that we're seeing in the Middle East have to do with climate change, or rather have been exacerbated by the impact of climate change across the whole of northern Syria and uh, northern Iraq. And, of course, one of the issues that we will need to think about, because all of these technologies require monitoring, they require sensors, they require collecting data and using it. The society that collects all this data, which might be at a personal level, might become a society that would have other ideas about how to use the data. That's uh, Tom Cruise in Minority Report, 
uh, film I recently looked at, and it's sort of, gee, that's sort of scary, and I wonder why my Blackberry is telling me about this shop that I'm just about to see around the corner, because my Blackberry knows where I am, and so does that shop. I still use a Blackberry, by the way, because I'm a proud Canadian. <laughs> <coughs> and I like the little keyboard. In any event, these are some of the issues, and I've chosen climate change as the organizing principle because I think that's the area where engineers can make the biggest impact. And I'll come back to that. But nonetheless, climate change as part of the sustainable development goals is something that engineers have something to say about because engineers will invent the things that mitigate the impact of climate change and will prevent it from getting worse uh, through energy efficiency, uh, through uh, different kinds of energy sources, and through the application of new energy to how we live our lives. Now, this is a very fanciful thing, and I believe I have the original paper here. Yes, here we are, Wired Magazine, Pussy Riot on the front. And that's the original. This, uh, for those of you who do not know Wired Magazine, it is a wonderful place if you're interested to read about, if you want to know how the future is happening today and how it might happen in the future. This is a chart from this month's uh, Wired, which you can't read the little pieces of, but effectively, the center is today in these five areas of technology. Green technology, biotech, nanotech, neurotech, which is the, the brand new thing about understanding how the wiring of our brain works, and digital technology, which we're all pretty familiar with. And the middle is what happens today. And as you move out on the rings, that's Wired's prediction for what are the big issues in 2065. Never one to predict there, you know, just modestly, but watch this space, it's what's called. This was, uh, this chart was thought out by a group of people at Imperial College London called, uh, I think it's the Imperial Smarties. Yes, that's what they call themselves. Smarties, as in, yeah. Uh, what is interesting about this chart is that if you look at the center, these five kinds of technologies, I think basically better, better called engineering, are divergent. Or sorry, but as they move out to 2065, they all start to meet. That the colors all, they're all sort of linking. There are fewer, so we say, diagonals, radials, and they're all sort of merging toward the center. Uh, some of these, like having a little tattoo that they put on you temporarily, and the tattoo interacts with your skin to do a, a diagnosis. That is a somewhat fanciful view of engineering, and sort of, oh, well, why would I use that? Well, there are a lot of things we carry around today, where, including iPads, where people say, well, why would you need to carry the internet around in your, in your bag? We will do that. But let's think of some of the things that might occur. We have agricultural technology. There are people working on generating meat without animals, which might, in fact, it's a very interesting issue of genetic engineering. Um, but, and it tastes like meat. I don't think, I'd, I haven't tried one yet, but apparently there's something that looks like a hamburger. Um, a vaccine that's for you, because it's looked at your genetic makeup and it says, these things will work for you and they'll do it sort of on the spot. You know, take your blood, okay, this vaccine needs to be tweaked and it'll be tweaked. Uh, machines for quick personal diagnosis. Uh, Drones that will be used in emergencies to take stock of things, and people already do that, and not just to do Amazon.com. Now, I'm going to do a little divergence here. This is an Amazon.com package, and I'm going to, I have not opened it, but because I, I know that when I buy something online from Amazon.com, they're going to tell me when it comes, and it's going to be what I want. And I'm going to open it. I haven't opened it. And what do I have in here? But, indeed, it's what I, what I bought. Jeffrey Sachs' new book, The Age of Sustainable Development, which was published today in Canada. And here it is, delivered today to my office up on Blur Street. And a book called 419, which is about scams in Nigeria and how they fit to globalization. Hmm? It's a good book? Good, I'm glad I'm right until the end. Okay, all right, fine. But, you know, I opened the box knowing what was going to be in it. I ordered it online. I paid for it online. It arrived, and I knew that if I opened it in front of you, this was probably what I ordered. 
That didn't exist 10 years ago. Now, the other interesting thing is, this is Jeffrey Sachs' book. The reason I bought the book is that on Friday, when I was in Santa Barbara, I watched a webcast at the World Bank. Jeffrey Sachs goes to the World Bank now to publish, to uh, launch his books. He comes to the World Bank, gives a lecture. And this book, let me see whether it's got a price on it, $34.95. Well, it just says $34.95, so I don't know. All right. I went on Amazon's site in the United States, and it was $25.68 US. So I put it into my shopping cart, and I said, oh, but I want it quickly. Let me see what it is in Canada. So I went to Amazon.ca, where I also have an account, and Amazon.ca was in other words, $4 in nominal terms cheaper, but then the Canadian exchange rate. I got this for 35% off what Amazon in the United States was prepared to sell it to me for. And I didn't have to pay to get it delivered here on Tuesday. So there's arbitrage, and I could make that comparison sitting online, Amazon.ca, Amazon.com. So fine, this has transformed our lives, and I'm sorry I didn't have a drone sort of come in and deliver it. but. <laughs> I think that's an example of how that changes our lives, and I don't know whether, I'm sure Jeffrey Sachs didn't lose money on the fact I bought it in Canada. He probably didn't make as much. But nonetheless, that's an example of what globalization has brought to us. And I will give that box for someone to recycle it later. However, that's, uh, now, materials for energy saving, energy generation. There's a great grad of this university who set up a company called OTI Photonics, and they make nanomaterials that glow in any color you want, and they're working on something that will actually generate the collect the solar energy for the panel to, to glow. And that would transform architecture because you wouldn't need lamps. It would maybe be visual displays that lit up. It would be, oh, I'm tired of looking out on my neighbor's garden. I want a view as if I was on the 35th floor of a, in a condominium at Young and Carl. So fine, I could have that on my wall. But again, an energy-saving material uh, invented here in Canada. Where it's going to be manufactured, we'll see. But again, you can imagine that a panel like that, low energy, high reliability, very durable because it bends. If you were in a developing country and you wanted some light, having one of these panels in your house with a little solar panel on the roof would provide your, ho your home with lighting in the evening for a woman and her daughter to study together. Geoengineering, I mentioned. The algorithms and the smart machines for urban services. The bridge that told you that it had, or the, the street that told you it had a pothole. Like, wouldn't it be wonderful if the 400,000 potholes in Toronto had all sent a message to City Hall? To say, <laughs> <laughs> I was surprised there were just 400,000. But uh, anyway, but you know, they, they, they appear because the snow melts. But if you had materials, and sidewalks and bridges that told you there's a problem because they had sensors. Or the engineering from the entire road was looked at and an algorithm said, you know, there's likely to be a problem next week. When do we schedule the repair team to come out when it will make the least damage and how do we send a message to vehicles? Please find another route to work. And if the vehicles don't have drivers, so much the better, there won't be a choice. But you can imagine that the algorithms and the smart machines with sensors in them will change how we live and the sorts of questions that we have to worry about in our daily lives. So, just a few things just to uh, let's see if I've left anything out. These are pictures. There is a solar-powered airplane that began its journey around the world yesterday. And it's somewhere, I guess, between Switzerland and Dubai today, or Switzerland and Abu Dhabi. Uh, those are three Afghan girls with their skateboards. Uh, before the war in Afghanistan, the girls' enrollment was, I think, 4%. Now it's about uh, most girls are in school. The boys still outnumber the girls. We have drones, which uh, aren't always military, but can be used for other things. We have a child beside a, what looks like a water filter, and then a village with their water supply, cities, 
Uh, cheap smartphones, that's the new BlackBerry that apparently you can buy in Indonesia that's cheaper than the new BlackBerry you can buy here. A little uh, orange thing is an array which could do a blood sample, do a complete blood workout without refrigeration, and it would tell the medical technician right there what you needed, and, though, and, and then could be analyzed attached to her smartphone. Uh, 3D printing is an interesting one. Has anybody seen a 3D printer that looks about the size? They're about the size of a bread box now, the little ones. There are some big ones too. Um, 3D printing, you could imagine that if you were in a village and you had a pump and the pump needed a part, well, all right, when's, when's the part going to arrive? How long is it going to take to get here? You could imagine that if the pump said, this part has failed, and sent the information to the village chief's 3D printer, and the village chief had the materials, and then the spare part was done. They're already doing this on the space shuttle, on the uh, International Space Station. There's a 3D printer up there that actually makes spare parts for something that breaks on the International Space Station. But a more interesting use of 3D printing would be prosthetics. And that's a, a girl on a bike with her uh, prosthetic leg, which has been fitted just for her. And unfortunately, there is a big demand for those because a lot of the world is in conflict with landmines and other casualties of war. The idea of being able to fit a child who stumbled across a landmine, uh, a woman who was the sole support for her family was something that could be made for her with 3D printing and laser technology for her, easy to replace, not expensive to build. That is doable today, but you can imagine that could be scaled. And smart machines, I think, are at the basis of all this. So let me just conclude <clears throat> by talking about science, technology, engineering, and math as the way that we improve well-being and that we can improve the well-being of all in the 21st century. Science is the study of our natural world and its understanding. Science is also a way of doing things. It is a way of looking at a hypothesis and proving whether it's right or wrong. Uh, in a time when there are anti-vaxxers, at a time when there are people who deny, deny science, uh, deny climate change, science is more important than ever. And engineers understand science. And it would be nice if more people did. But science, the understanding of the natural world and its physical properties is a rather important part of the world that we live in, and a rather important part of the advocacy piece for global development in the 21st century. Uh, engineers create the designed world. Uh, all of you, under, all of the undergraduates or recent grads have uh, benefited from design of the curriculum. One of the exciting things that I think engineering at U of T did in the last 15 years. Um, engineers look at the design world. What's the problem? Who are the people we're serving? How will it make their lives better? What can we do? And are used to optimizing within constraints. So that's what design is. Technology applies the products and processes that engineers design. And that technology part is very important. Technology isn't just about the craftsman. It's about the 3D printer. It's about the little chip. It's about all the things that actually transform that design into things that are usable. And mathematics describes what's going on. Algorithms and in a world of big data. What do we know about the world? And how can we fit, fit a, a very data intensive world very quantified world together to understand new patterns and to get new things done. And that's what global development will be. What are the patterns that predict whether things will work or not work? Whether countries or cities or neighborhoods or families will succeed or fail. That data, those data are all there. They're crunched in big machines that engineers have invented and they're understood and transformed into real things by the things engineers design and create. But what do engineers do about this? Well, there are three things. Engineers create the world of global development through the things that engineers invent. Engineers need to be able to explain it to people. And that's one area where engineers might have done a little better job of explaining <coughs> what engineers do. That, yes, you know, engineers made it possible for Nike to you know, make shoes and ship them all to Walmart. Same time, I'd rather buy something from Nike because I know Nike's concerned about its reputation and isn't going to have 
bad labor conditions in its factories because it would be on the internet and would go viral. Again, engineers have a piece of that. And engineers have to advocate for the things engineers do and for the things that engineers can do to make life better. And that's something that you know, engineers in public policy, engineers who go over to the dark side and become economists and managers and politicians need to do. So I think that's a pretty big mandate. Um, engineering at Toronto, I think, is a great place to do it. And uh, global development is something that I think engineers need to uh, be very much involved in. So thank you very much. Oh, yes. Now, uh, questions are being collected. Sonia has got cards, and Brenda and I are going to... Are you going to sit down, or are you going to walk around, Brenda? What would you like to do? If you can hear if I need the mic, or if you can hear me otherwise. Uh, I'm used to using my teaching voice, so... Uh, but I'll, I'll try to use this. Actually, they're making a... They're making, I don't, do, we, do we have to sort of sit being close together so the video can get it, or what would the... What oh, would our sorry. videographer like so, to do? I, sorry, I, I'm creating havoc, am I? No, um, I just wanted to make sure we were doing what they wanted. Okay. <laughs> so while these questions are being collected, uh, Paul, I just have one small uh, question for you. The, the, the global development requires a huge multidisciplinary approach to make sure that we do it as well as we can. And can you talk about a few ways in which engineers are being integrated into that process? That's a, that's a great question. I think that the answer fundamentally is not well enough. Uh, because engineers, and I'm going to sort of use myself as an example, engineers either go and work as engineers and they work as, in engineering companies or for governments and they work as engineers, which is great because how would things get done if engineers didn't invent things? Or they go and get degrees in economics or they become lawyers or they become MBAs and then they go into um, places where their engineering sensibilities are there, but they're not really engineers. And the answer that I would give, I guess, is that I would hope that more organizations in the private sector and the public sector are actually going to say, well, look, uh, we don't want the engineers to all become generalists, and we don't want the lawyers to all become engineers, because that's impossible, or the sociologists to become engineers. What we all need to do is to remember what our background is and what we're basically skilled at, and we need to be able to talk to people and be in teams that include the other specialists who are needed to get things done, and that we all appreciate and understand and to some ex extent speak the language of the sociologist or the economist or the management specialist or the doctor or the lawyer so that they under, we, can under, we can put across what we believe needs to be done and how we would approach it. And we also can listen respectfully, but at the same time, with a question, knowing enough to question what we're hearing about uh, what they're telling us needs to be done so that we can interact with them and be influential. Uh, there aren't, all, like, the World Bank does not have as many engineers as it ought to. And if you look at the rest of the global system, you know, the global financial system, there are probably you know, engineers that are quants on Wall Street or Bay Street. Well, that's engineering, but a very particular kind. Uh, I would imagine that the engineers at Apple have become very good at talking to the marketing people uh, and the designers and bringing the designers in at the beginning. But I'm not sure we quite have the answer Nonetheless, I think organizations that allow various specialties to work together in teams are the ones that are going to integrate the engineers best into the global development challenges that I've tried to speak about this afternoon. Okay. Thank you. So we have quite a few very, very good questions here. So I'll just try to start at the top and good. then we'll sort through. What is the likelihood that there could be an international agreement by countries to use carbon capture technology to eliminate carbon emissions from coal, oil, and natural gas-fired power plants? Uh, well, first you'd have to, have to have the engineering to do it. Uh, and I, I, there, there are, I don't know the technology well enough. There's apparently a company in Canada that seems to be the furthest along, and there's a power plant in Saskatchewan. 
Where? But to do carbon capture and storage? Okay, and how much is the power that comes out of that plant per kilowatt hour? How much per kilowatt hour? Do I want to pay it? But carbon capture and storage is clearly quite important as part of the decarbonized world. Um, and the fact that there are many countries that do not have a lot of energy sources other than coal. So somebody's going to have to invent that. Uh, putting it in terms of the International Climate Agreement, countries are going to have their own goals and how they meet them, it looks, is going to be very much determined country by country. So the country will make a commitment and then the countries that need help buying the technology to, make that commit, to meet that commitment will be given some form of financing to buy the technology that's needed. Uh, but an international agreement that everybody has to use it, I would be surprised if that happened. I think it's more likely there'll be a, an overall country by country specific commitment and then implementation will be, well, what do you have to do to get to the lower carbon and eventually zero carbon future? Is that carbon storage? Is that carbon capture and storage? Is it more hydro? Is it because you're very sunny, you're going to go solar? Is it because you're very windy? But it, or is it going to be all of the above? And frankly, I think that nuclear has got to be part of that, which means somebody's got to figure out a way to do nuclear power plants in a way that's rather cheaper and is not going to take forever and will provide a level of safety that's even better than what, what nuclear plants experience in the whole world already, despite the three major nuclear incidents that we're all aware of. Okay. Along the similar line, what did you mean when you, when you said that gas prices should be the same in Rio de Janeiro as in Toronto and why? All right. Um, let's say I can afford to have an SUV. I might be, you know, having to cross, uh, you know, having to go through snow here in Toronto, so I spend $45,000. Actually, what does an SUV cost here? Nice, nice, nice Escalade or a Lexus SUV? $50,000, $60,000? How much? Sixty-five. okay. But the international price of Lexus is $65,000. So if I live in Rio de Janeiro, or let's say I live in Caracas, and I have my SUV, and I paid 65,000 because I can afford to pay 65,000 for an SUV. Why, and of course, my SUV gets the same gas mileage in Toronto as it does in Caracas. Uh, probably about as needed, well, probably even less needed in Caracas because there, aren't, there isn't ever snow in Caracas. You'd have to use the SUV to go over. So why should I be paying nine cents a liter in Caracas for fuel? It has a carbon burden, you know, because of emissions and all that. And here in Toronto, what is it, $1.06, $1.07 a liter? Uh, and that's probably cheap if you wanted to recover the social cost. So let's say, you know, I'm a rich person in Caracas, I'm a rich person in Toronto. Why shouldn't I pay $1.50 a liter for gasoline? Ooh, well, which is broke, but other than that, no. Then it, well, all right, let's say the United States. The United States, well, you know, not a socialist government, but you know, certainly nowhere near a dollar nine a liter in the United States. Should be, you know, and if you argue that the way to encourage people to not consume things that are carbon intensive is to put taxes on them, as the good people of British Columbia have proven to themselves, then. You know, a liter of motor fuel should cost the same, including all the carbon taxes, anywhere in the world with transport. But effectively, you're charged for the social cost. So I would say, you know, I don't see why a rich person in Caracas or in Rio or in Moscow or in, uh, well, Japan's pretty good, should be paying anything different from a rich person in a, another country. Now, if you say, well, look, the poor people also have like SUVs, probably they don't. You could say, well, if they're poor people, then we need to find a way to compensate them, as they have in British Columbia, as in other places, where you basically look at poor people are compensated a different way if, well, or in Indonesia, where they reduce the fuel subsidies. But they found a way 
to funnel transfers to poor people so that they would find that another thing they bought was cheaper or they would have cash if they still wanted to go out and buy motor fuel. It's an economics issue, but you know, will we hope that the inventors at General Motors and at Lexus are coming up with lower, with more fuel efficient vehicles? There is still a social and environmental cost of carbon of emissions that needs to be met if we're going to reduce global warming. So charge them all the same. Two, three dollars a liter, whatever. I don't feel strongly about this at all. <laughs> We have a couple of people who have asked a question about the relationship between today's, the, the world's problems and the growing population uh, in the globe, and what role, if any, the UN should play in that? Uh, well, those are sort of two different issues. Um, clearly, there are countries that uh, have population, the population growth, that's too high for the resources that are available in that country to provide people with a, a reasonable standard of living or even a, an acceptable standard of living. Uh, that, of course, is one of the concerns about Africa, that Africa will never escape poverty as long as birth rates remain high. But birth rates are going to remain high as long as families don't know if their children will survive. And the children do survive now because they're not dying of malaria, or as many of them aren't dying of malaria as they used to. They're not drying, dying of waterborne diseases. Uh, they are not, uh, well, they're, dry, they're dying in motor vehicle accidents, but nonetheless, the survival of children is increasing, but the number of children African families are having has not increased. Other places in the world have found that, as I said earlier, there are two things that uh, reduce your population growth. One of them is educating girls, and the other one is giving women reproductive rights, access to control their own reproduction. And unfortunately, there are poor countries where uh, girls are not educated and where safe and effective birth control is not available, and in some cases where women are not allowed to choose it. So that that is one thing. It would be nice to have um, some implementation of the UN, uh, the UN Convention on Human Rights that made those things a human right that governments were measured by. Um, and perhaps with the Sustainable Development Goals, where there are items about maternal health, there are items about primary education, where the fact that those are going to be measured means that governments are going to be saying, oh, I think I, be I don't really want to be at the bottom of the lead table on that. I really need to do something about girls' education. I need to do something about women having access to reproductive rights, which of course will improve maternal health. Uh, whether the UN will do it, well, the UN is, however imperfect, the body where decisions, where commitments like that are taken in the world today, and where there is at least a convening authority to collect and publish the data. One of the things about the Sustainable Development Goals that's quite interesting is that in addition to there being 17, because eight weren't enough, there are 169 indicators. And each of those indicators, uh, it is estimated, will cost one and a half billion dollars to measure. Now, I haven't looked at the, the basis for that. If you take those 169 indicators at a billion and a half each, that total equals 12% of the development budget that the world spends today on development assistance for poor countries. 12%. And that's a lot to pay for monitoring and evaluation so you can have a report every year. Then the number sounds, the number is from a group of scholars, Professor Lomborg in Copenhagen, who's not a big fan of the Sustainable Development Goals. Nonetheless, he is somebody who puts, num puts his numbers down and publishes them, which is, I think, one of the things that's also about the role of the UN. An agreement with the Sustainable Development Goals and monitoring countries, uh, country plans and how they implement and publishing that progress probably makes as much of, uh, has as much of an impact as having the development goals in the first place. Because no one will want to be lingering behind. Thank you. We have some engineering students and people Excellent. interested in education. 
So engineering students today are sorted into disciplines that are centered around pillars of knowledge, electrical, chemical, mechanical, etc. Do you think that grouping engineers by problems they'd like to solve, food supply for example, would be a more effective way of tackling the world's problems? Uh, well, it might be a more effective way of tackling the world's problems. I'm not sure it would be a more effective way of learning engineering. Uh, and I will defer to uh, you, Brenda, and to <laughs> Vice Provost McCann, and to the Dean, uh, and to Yu Ling on that issue. Um, I think one of, the, one of the big improvements, one of the many improvements that uh, engineering education in Toronto has made, in fact, I think it's really swept through all of engineering education, is design. Yes. Um, and the fact that you know, in first year, your first class is the big ESP class in Con Hall, and then you do a design project capstone in fourth year, and hopefully there's something in between, but I don't look at that anymore. I think that the fact that everybody looks at design means that the barriers, the pillars are perhaps a little more, well, can pillars be porous? The pillars are perhaps closer together than they were. Um, and that's a matter of, I, I think that, that the point that Problems do not necessarily fit inside civil or mechanical or industrial it is a very good one. And so the, to the extent that the curriculum and the learning experiences can be tailored to have third-year civils and third-year mechanicals working with third-year industrials on something that they could all contribute to and understand, you know, they understand most of the language they already speak because it's all based in math, physics, and chemistry. The fact that you could put them together and they could see the commonalities and come up with joint engineering solutions, I think, would be the way to do it. But I am not an engineering educator and I defer to <laughs> people who have done that all their lives. I think they were hoping for a different answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, in a way, I, I don't know whether medical, I don't know enough about medical education to know whether that's in fact what goes on, that you know, the whole body is examined as the whole body. I'm not sure engineering necessarily adapts itself to that. But I, uh, again, I'll... Certainly teamwork is a good way to go Teamwork is a good way to do it, yes. We have several questions here about technology, but we'll start with this one. Uh, they say data is the, newest, is the newest natural resource. To what extent will it be leveraged to drive innovation in an effort to achieve our, in, our international development goals? That's a great question. Um, I'm going to start with my rant on innovation, and then I'll sort of answer the question. Um, how many people get up in the morning and say, today I'm going to innovate? I give you have it on your to-do list, you write, innovate, 9 to, 9 to 11.30, innovate. No, what you probably do is you're working on something that's interesting and important to you. It's something that you've been trained to do and that your organization pays you to do or wants you to do. But it's an interesting and important problem. And one day, you, probably with your team or maybe with another worker, one day, you think of a new approach. Because, you know, you were in an art gallery yesterday. Or you were walking in the park. And you were thinking about something else. And then you had an, an aha moment. And that's probably what innovation is. It's more, I'm working on something interesting and important. I'm driven. That I really want to find a solution to this, and I all of a sudden have a different idea. Now, is that brain chemistry? Is that what you had for breakfast? Is it the music that you're listening to when you're with your headset on? I'm not really sure. Um, the use of data is actually an interesting part of that question because data would give you an idea about what's interesting and important. Um, you know that there's this big haystack, and a bigger haystack doesn't necessarily have more needles in it. On the other hand, it's easier to sort through the haystack if computers and algorithms are saying, hmm, this is something we don't usually see. Or, uh, and I think that a lot of the advances, say, in, um, uh, by, in uh, chem chemotherapy will be because somebody figures out that there are the four stem cells that, that did not get nailed. And they're still there in your body, and so we have to have a drug that goes after those four stem cells and the billions of cells in your body. That somebody will figure out how to do that. So that when you look at data as a natural resource, well, like any other natural resource, well, who owns it and what's going to happen to it? And how do you make sure the data stay pure? 
again, that's a natural resource issue. But, you know, I think data is really important, but I, I would not discount insight or serendipity or a quiet moment when something's preying on my mind and I woke up at three in the morning and, aha, let me just write down that dream and go back to sleep. And continuing down the, the road of innovation, how do we minimize the consequences of the inevitable failures from increased innovation? And are we free from catastrophic failures of the past? So, so we've got innovation, but there's also failures in innovation, and they're not always, they're not always positive to, but is to the failure, But is the failure in innovation the failure to innovate, or is it somebody innovates and oops, unintended consequences? What's the unintended consequences? Well, in a way, big data can allow you to do better modeling of what might happen, particularly in engineering. Um, it's also a matter of, I would have thought, being better attuned to risk. Because anything you do, there's, you know, there's risk management involved in design and in execution. And so, well, what's the high probability well, what's the, the high impact negative event? What's the worst thing that could happen? And then you think through that. And what's the likelihood that would happen? And then you can sum it up or you can model it and say, well, you know, there's a 94% likelihood that my portfolio will allow me to live in the style to which I've become accustomed till I'm 96 years old. 94%, 96 years old, mm, sounds good enough. So that in fact, that modeling, which you know, would be a matter of, aha, I have a great idea. What's the downside of this and what's the likelihood of that happening is the way to do it. And that's where issues about geoengineering and some of these more exotic technologies happen. Uh, that's, you know, the whole issue about SIM cards and does the NSA have the encryption tool to encrypt everything on everybody's SIM card in the whole world? And they may. That's an unintended consequence of Maybe there being five manufacturers of SIM cards in the whole world. Or that most of the internet traffic goes through the United States. Oh, well, good, it can be sniffed. And so they put a ring around the fiber optic cable and they get all the metadata and who knows what else. So that, yeah, there are unintended consequences, but then, you know, we live in a free society where we should be able to query some of that innovation. Because let's remember that a lot of innovation that had, takes place in the world and has taken place is paid for by government. Whether it is research, particularly in the United States, and a lot of it was defense related, whether it's the space program or supercomputers or fiber optics or nuclear power, it was paid for by the government because they commissioned it. Or it was paid for by the government because they gave corporations tax breaks to write off their innovation while they, as a cost of doing business. So that if you're looking to have some, uh, well, in a free society, if you're either paying for things directly, like research, or if you're paying things for indirectly through tax breaks, there is surely the opportunity to say, well, what exactly is being researched? And countries have reacted differently. Like the United Kingdom has a very different view of reproductive health research than from, Can from the United States, for example. Canada is somewhere in the middle. There are certain medical technologies that can be researched and used in Europe that are not yet approved in the United States. So that every country is sort of setting its own limits about, well, what's permissible? And part of living in a democracy, and fortunately many of most people in the world, well, maybe not most, many people in the world now live in democracies, is the opportunity when money of the public is involved for us as citizens to help elected representatives and governments draw the limits on what can be looked at. Now, that's, I, I don't think I've quite addressed the question, but that's sort of how I would approach it. There was another question that kind of followed along. Um, do we love technology for its own sake? We've got drones that we have difficulty managing don't know where the, the owners are and things like that, and also big data and its misuse. Um, well, it's well, technology, like the first time a drone takes out an airplane, I would imagine, when it's coming into land, like in Washington, Washington National Airport, 
that the next day there will be legislation about drones and you will not be able to buy them on Amazon.com. Actually, I should have ordered a drone this <laughs> Flown it around. Has anyone actually seen a little drone? They're, they're quite amazing. I was at a, a, a technology lecture in a fairly confined area, like an office building with, you know, 10, 11 foot ceilings, and they had a drone. They had two 3D printers, and they had a drone. And the drone sat there, and there was somebody over in the corner playing with the drone, and the drone rose, and the drone looked at you, and the drone came close enough that it could look you in the eye, probably did a retinal scan while it was, you know, looking at me. Um, you know, every technology can be misused, and the you know, drones are, are something that we're, you know, because they were first used in warfare, we're all saying, ooh, drones, not comfortable. But when you think of drones being used after a weather disaster, when you think of drones being used after an earthquake, to actually go in very quickly and get a, a view and be able to direct the drone to look at pieces of critical technology, or to look at the state of the hospital, or to go to places where the road's been cut off and maybe the cell phone towers are down. Uh, or to say, look, there is an empty space here. If we had to move through the medical helicopters, we could do it there. You know, much faster than it would take if you did aerial photography or satellite photography, which of course has been used in post-disaster situations for a long time. You know, there are very positive things about drones. Uh, I don't include Amazon.com deliveries or pizza. But nonetheless, you know, that's a technology where I think I'd be prepared to say, okay, drones are okay. And even in the era of warfare, you know, the rules of war did not anticipate airplanes or submarines or a whole lot of other things. The rules of war, you know, we're uncomfortable with a guy sitting with a joystick in Arizona directing a drone strike. But when airplanes were first invented and used in war, there were people that were uncomfortable with that. And the world will figure out drones and warfare like they figured out airplanes and submarines. Um, you know, there are downsides to any technology. The question about the use of data, fortunately, the public in Europe and in particular, and in the United States, well, Europe in particular, have really put restrictions on what data, what data being collected can be used for. Uh, Canada's record is perhaps not as good as the Europeans, and the Europeans have been quite ruthless in telling the United States what they're prepared to share. Again, I think we live in a democracy, so that's where we have to say, look, our elected representatives have to do things. The discussion of C-51, C I think, is an example where the public has indicated there will be a debate. And I think the same is true about the use of data. Difficulty is that, you know, we're sitting here and we all have our cell phones on, so somebody knows where we all are. And, you know, and uh, I hope, you know, if any of you go out and be famous, the fact that you're famous for something, and say, oh, well, he was once in a lecture with Paul Canario and Brendan McCabe, sort of, oh, well, they're good people, they know that celebrity, rather than some other reason about why were they in the same room that afternoon. You know, that sort of thing. But, you know, if you live in the 21st century, you leave a trail of data as you walk around the city going about your business. You leave a trail of data when you do a Google search, even when you go to the library and use, it, use the library. You leave a trail of data when you buy something online, when you get on an airplane. You know, and I think we've all come to live with that. And in some countries, you, live, you leave a trail of data when you walk around the street. In London, you know, you're apparently, a person in London will be photographed 220 times every day and connected to computers that have facial recognition software. And the British public is okay with that. If you tried to do it in New York, and I'll bet they already do, there would be an uproar. And I don't know what the view would be down on Bay Street, but I'll bet when you go in, when you're walking in the path, that they needed to know who was in the path at a particular moment. They, somebody would know. And I think this might have to be our last question. But I think that global engineering or global innovation lies with the young people. 
The goals of sustainable development is for the future and for the young. What would you say to the participation of young people in terms of engineering our global innovation? Well, who's going to do it if young people don't? Um, I have to say, and I don't say that to flatter my current and foreign stu former students, but when I think of the uh, questions that get asked and the tools available to young engineers today to go and look at unusual problems that are not just here in Toronto or here in Canada, you know, the world is out there to apply engineering skills and to think of innovative things to do with those skills to solve problems, i.e to look at important and interesting problems to you and apply your skills to those problems. So, yeah, I think that's part of it. Uh, so, go out and do it. Um, second thing is, I think there is a great deal to be said for knowing another language. Not only because you can travel in those countries and know what's being said, you can go in a, you know, with your sociologists who are local and you can ask about, you can hear what the people are saying and say, let me just make sure I understood what Madame told me about her life in the slum and how we could make it better because I, I wasn't quite sure what she said. You can ask Madame yourself. Um, so learning another language is good, not only for that, but also you learn about the culture while you learn that other language. And often the culture is good at asking questions in a different way and hearing the answers in a way differently from the way we would hear them here in Toronto or in Canada. And I guess the other thing is um, get in a plane and go traveling. Um, you know, and be inquisitive. Um, anybody from the Cairo team here today? Okay, Cairo team's here, yeah. Um, I have a great team in Civ 498 who's looking at improving the garbage collection in Cairo with the Zebeline. And the Zebeline are Coptic Christians who collected the garbage and they sorted the garbage and they had pigs that ate the stuff that couldn't be recycled. As it happened, I went to Cairo. So off I went, you know, sort of where do I go? And I want to see the church because it's a UNESCO site and okay, I need to go to the Zebeline. And of course, watching the, you know, the, the donkey carts going around Cairo collecting the garbage, I was able to come back and say, I didn't know this. Or, well, look at this. Or, oh, here's an interesting idea. And I talked to this guy and in fact, there are empty spaces in the area you're working on. So there's nothing more informative than to go and look with your own eyes. And I think that there are a whole lot of professions that spend their lives in the library and looking at big data and crunching numbers, economists being one of them. Engineers, fortunately, you know, even electrical engineers. Engineers, fortunately, have a world that we can go and observe. And we can look at it, and we can feel it, and we can sometimes smell it. But it's also a world that if you sit there and say, well, what does theory tell me about this? And how do I apply this theory? And, hmm, there's something that I hadn't expected. What is it? And being inquisitive with your own insights and being able to come up with a nice way to ask somebody in their own language, I sort of thought this was going to happen, but I'm surprised. I'm curious about this. So, you know, speaking the language, getting on the plane and being curious, I think that's what complements what engineering students are learning. And uh, I think that's one of the things that's great about U of T engineering, that professors are curious and students should be curious too. Okay, so that's going to be at the end of our question period. I'd, I'd like to uh, invite Professor Yuling Cheng to come forward. Those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Yuling Cheng. I'm a professor in chemical engineering, and I'm also the director of our Center for Global Engineering. I've uh, been working closely with Paul on a number of things over the past few years. Uh, my role today is to thank Paul. And, but before I do that, um, I'd like to thank all of you first for coming, uh, the alumni among you and the students among you in, in particular. Uh, you've been a great audience, uh, not just for coming, but also being so engaged in asking so many insightful questions. Uh, but the main job is to, is to, to thank Paul. Uh, just so you get a sense of how masterful Paul's talk was, I actually attended a full workshop on sustainable development goals 
back in December. Ooh. And in a few short minutes, uh, Paul's presentation and description of the Sustainable Development Goals actually taught me some things. <laughs> so it's, and, and I think that, that speaks to how much of an insider he has been and the depth of an understanding that he has about global development. And mainly what I got out of his talk, I think of it as, as two things. One, I was inspired, even though I've been working in this space for a few years now, I was inspired by the number of opportunities there are for engineers to make a contribution and to do work in this space. There's, whether you're a materials engineer, whether you work in energy systems, whether you're in biomedical engineering, there's a role for you to do something impactful. A second thing that I, was, that I got from Paul's talk was that I thought he really, he did a great job of informing us about engineers' role in this very, very complex space. It's not just technology, uh, it's technology in the context of many, many other things. And so he did a great job on, on both counts. Uh, so, so thank you for, for this, for, first of all, for, for this talk. Uh, mostly for in, in terms of today, but in the, the bigger picture, uh, thank you for your unfailing commitment and dedication to the faculty and particularly to the students. I thought that last question was, was right on and it's a perfect last question for, for today. The role of uh, students, future engineers in global innovation. And you gave some ter terrific advice. So thank you, Paul. Thank you.